session so we can just do some agenda maintenance and agenda homework. Uh, so tonight we've got four proclamations. The first one is National Prevention Week. So I think Councilor Hill, you'll be doing that one. And then we have Public Service Recognition Week. If you'd like to do that. Uh, National Police Week and Gun Violence Awareness Month. More proclamations. Um, as far as Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Jesse's here from the Veterans Group, Jesse Thompson who's taking the place of Dale Potts as the organizer for our Memorial Day services. So he's agreed to do the Pledge of Allegiance for tonight. And then any questions on consent agenda? All right. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up our very brief work session for tonight. Recording stopped. <laughs> Recording in progress. Good evening and welcome everyone to the May 8th, 2023 Tualatin City Council regular council meeting. Uh, tonight I'm going to go ahead and call this to order and we have a special guest leading us on our Pledge of Allegiance, Jesse Thompson. Come on up, Jesse. Please rise and join me at the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight is a proclamation declaring the week of May 7, 2013, 2023, as National Prevention Week in the city of Tualatin and is being led by Capitol Hill. Proclamation declaring the Proclamation National Prevention Week in the city of Tualatin. Whereas substance misuse and mental health problems affect all communities nationwide, according to the 2021 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an estimated 61.2 million Americans ages 12 and older used illicit drugs in the past year. Nearly 6 million young people aged 12 to 20 reported drinking alcohol in the past month. Nearly 2% of Americans, or 74 million people, aged 12 and older used tobacco products or used an e-cigarette or other vaping device to vape nicotine in the past month. Additionally, in 2021, 8.7 million Americans misused prescription pain relief. I do have these all set. Whereas with commitment and support, these and other substance use and mental health issues can be prevented. The focus of National Prevention Week is to change the prevention landscape by providing evidence-based and accessible resources to facilitate collective action and story sharing. By showcasing the work of our partners in prevention, we can confront the societal changes surrounding substance misuse together while celebrating stories of prevention. Whereas this is a message we need to spread far and wide, an estimated 29.5 million people aged 12 and older in America were classified as having alcohol misuse disorder in the past year. And about 57.8 million adults had a mental illness. The impact of mental and substance misuse disorders is apparent in our local community. An estimated 5,058 people in Tualatin, Oregon are affected by these conditions. We have the power to change these numbers and more importantly, change lives. 
Whereas through National Prevention Week, people become more aware and able to recognize the signs of mental health and substance use disorders. Equally important, community members from all walks of life learn what they can do to create a healthier tomorrow by helping to prevent these problems. Being a shoulder for someone to lean on, leading someone to get help for a mental health or substance use issue before it worsens, setting an example by staying substance free, and other actions like this all play a role in keeping the people around us and ourselves healthy and safe. Whereas we and others across the United States need to recognize the seriousness of substance use and mental health issues in our communities, the power of prevention, and the tireless efforts of those working to make a difference. The small daily actions done by individuals combined with the actions of families, communities, and coalitions come together to make up the large, larger, bold movement of prevention. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Tualatin hereby proclaim May 7th through 13th, 2023 to be National Prevention Week and call upon our community to join us this week in celebrate, celebrating the compelling programs and events that support increasing awareness of and action around mental health and or substance use disorders year round. Introduced and adopted this 8th day of May, 2023, City of Tualatin, Oregon. I see there's some Tualatin Together reps slash LEAP representatives want to come up and make comments. Familiar faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Always had something to say. I, I do. Start again. Let me find it. <laughs> Let me find it. Okay. Uh, please come to our community event uh, Thursday, May 11th at Tualatin High School for our, uh, what do we like? We call it community event. We're going to have a resource fair at starting at 6 to 6.45. There'll also be food there. And then starting at 6.45 to 8.30 p.m., we're going to do a movie and community discussion over the movie uh, First Day by Chris Heron. Can you tell us what LEAP is? Because it's a new name for something. Yeah, so we were uh, last year formerly known as Stand Up, uh, which has an acronym no one remembers. Uh, <laughs> and we decided we wanted to rebrand to be more towards uh, youth and something we thought that would speak out more. So we went with LEAP, which has an acronym I do remember, which is Leadership, Education, Advocacy, and Prevention. Yeah, and it's fresh focuses in Tualatin High School and the area around it, but we like to try and stay Tualatin High School. Hey, thank you for proclaiming this National thank Prevention Week. It's important for us in our community. And if you haven't seen Chris Heron, come Thursday. You'll be impacted. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. That brings us to our second proclamation, which is a proclamation declaring the week of seven, uh, May 7th through 13th, 2023 as Public Service Recognition Week in the city of Tualatin. Uh, city Manager Sharon Lombos have some remarks and then Council Reyes will read the proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. So Public Service Recognition Week is celebrated the first week of May since 1985 to honor the people who serve our nation as federal, state, county, local, and tribal government employees. Here in Tualatin, we have approximately 160 employees in 10 departments. Our, employers, our employees can be found every, everywhere around the city, from the library, to the parks, to construction sites, and the courtroom. They do everything from keeping the peace, to issuing permits, to, permitting, uh, to monitoring grant requirements, and leading classes at the Poll Center, and so much more. We have four employees with over 30 years of service here, including Ernie Castro in our water department, Dave Coons in parks maintenance, Bert Olheiser in streets and sewer, and Eric Herman in police. Approximately 40% of our employees have been here for over 10 years, which gives us stability and institutional knowledge. Approximately 20% of our employees live right here in Tualatin, contributing to those who live and work here. I am very proud of our organization. We are mission-driven and values-based. Our employees embody the spirit of public service. Thank you to the council for your support, for the great employees who uh, work here, and always 
but especially this week, uh, public service recognition. Thank you. That's great. That's very nice, uh, Charlene. And I just want to say that how proud I am to read um, this proclamation because I do believe every word uh, I'm reading here. Um, so thank you. Proclamation declaring the week of May 7th May to May through May 13th, 2023 as Public Service Recognition Week in honor of the public employees of the city of Tualatin. Whereas public service is an honorable calling that involves a wide variety of challenging and rewarding professions, including providing recreational services, maintaining public safety, improving transportation, protecting our environment, and performing administrative and management activities, which are essential to efficient and effective operations of government. And whereas Tualatin City employees contribute significantly to the quality of life for the Tualatin community with their commitment to excellence, high ethical standards, and diversity of skills. And whereas excellence is the delivery of public service, helps keep Tualatin strong, prosperous, and a wonderful place in which to live, work, play, and volunteer. And whereas this com commemoration provides an opportunity to express our appreciation for the many contributions public employees make to our daily lives. Now, therefore, it is proclaimed by the city of Tualatin that the week, the week of May 7th through the 13th, 2023, the Public Service Recognition Week in the city of Tualatin and the council encourages everyone to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of public employees. Introduced and adopted this eighth day of May, 2023. Thank you. I just wanna acknowledge and agree with Council Reyes uh, as city councilors, we get lots of emails and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but they're always good about our city employees. Um, we get rave reviews, residents come out of the woodwork, very surprising, just random encounters. Or also we'll get an email saying, you know, uh, this city employee went out of their way or helped me with this. You know, they were, you know, pivotal in helping me navigate some system in the city. And I, I very much appreciate that. And the environment Cheryl has set up here for employees to exceed, to exceed and excel in this environment, and they get terrific community support. Any other comments? All right, thank you. That brings us to item number three: proclamation declaring the week of May 14th through 20th, 2023, as National Police Week in the City of Twalton. I believe Captain oh, Captain Chief. Chief Pickering, keep doing it. It's going to come on up. All right, I'm sorry. You <laughs> might have been years. Yeah, you know. I saw Brian sitting over there before. Yeah. Welcome, Chief. Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you very much. Uh, first off, I want to say that the members of the Tualatin Police Department are very thankful for the amazing community that we serve and the support of our community members. When I sat down to write these comments last Friday, 34 police officers across the nation had been killed in the line of duty in 2023 including one from the small community of Nyssa here in Oregon. Sadly, today, only three days later, that number is now 36. A law enforcement officer in the United States dies every 56 hours in the line of duty. I am honored to lead this police department, and I pray for their health and safety every day. So, members of council, mayor, thank you very much for taking the time to recognize the members of our department and for those police officers across the nation who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Declaring the week of National Police Week in the city of Tualatin. Whereas the Congress of the United States of America has designated May 15th as Police Officers Memorial Day in honor of the federal, state, and municipal officers who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty, and the week which, in which it falls as National Police Week and Whereas it is known that an av on average, one law enforcement officer is killed in the line of duty somewhere in the United States every 54 hours. Since the first known line of duty death in 1791, more than 23,000 U.S. law enforcement officers have been made the ultimate sacrifice. And whereas law enforcement officers, including 12 and police officers, are our guardians of life and property and defenders of the individual rights of freedom, 
And whereas the city of Tualatin is proud of our law enforcement officers and wish to recognize their commitment to the public safety profession. And whereas the Tualatin Police Department and officers provide the highest quality services and are committed to the highest professional standards, working in partnership with our community to meet the challenges of reducing crime, creating a safe environment, improving our quality of life for all. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the city of Tualatin designates the week of May 14th through 20th, 2023 as National Police Week in the city of Tualatin. We call attention to our police, Tualatin police officers for the outstanding service they provided to our community. Introduced to you this eighth day of May, 2023. I just want to make a comment. I got an anecdote today, actually speaking to a resident who on Friday had her 18 year old neighbor uh, put on her new plates onto her vehicle. She did that, drove through Tualatin and was pulled over by a motorcycle officer who said, where are your tags? And she was like, what tags? He goes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> the young man had forgotten to affix his little decals to the plates. And she reported the officer was super nice explain what would happen and said just go order a replacement she said very polite very nice interaction and she was just raving about it, how well it was handled versus you know writing a ticket like that just rave review i know who it is too because she described them <laughs> so he's done a great job just to let you know that you know as far as community involvement and residents having that interface with our police department today was a great example thank you thank you so it brings us to our fourth proclamation for tonight, a proclamation declaring June 2023 as Gun Violence Awareness Month for the city of Tualatin. I'm going to have the Moms and Man Action folks come on up, led by Terry, for some short comments. And then we'll have Councilor Brooks. They're right behind you there, Terry. <laughs> oh, okay, they're behind me. Good have I'll sit Thank me. you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> Um, good evening. My name is Terry Mills. I'm a longtime nurse educator, um, really believe highly in prevention. So I'm glad to see the different pro proclamations tonight. I'm also um, the legislative and elections lead for the Tualatin chapter of Moms Demand Action. And I want to thank Mary, Mayor Bubinick and also the Tualatin City Council um, for proclaiming June Gun Violence Aware Awareness Month. Tualatin will be joining hundreds of cities nationwide in this movement, including Tigard and Lake Oswego. And to put gun violence in perspective here in Oregon, in an average year, 544 people die and 617 are wounded by guns. Oregon has the 34th highest rate of gun violence in the United States. As I'm sure you're all aware, Guns are now the leading cause of death for children, one to 18. And I have to say in my 40, well, now it's 50 years as a registered nurse, I never thought I would be saying that, never. Um, in Oregon, an average of 31 children and teens die by guns every year, of which 63% of these deaths are suicide and 31% are homicides. And in the United States, 35% of all gun deaths among children and teens are suicides, and 60% are homicides. On January 21st, 2013, 15-year-old Hadia Pendleton marched in President Obama's inaugural parade. And just one week later, she was shot and killed in a playground in Chicago. Soon after this tragedy, Hadia's childhood friends decided to commemorate her life by wearing orange, the color hunters wear in the woods to protect themselves and others. Wear orange began in June of 2015, what would have been Hadia's 18th birthday. And since then, wear orange has actually, it, it just keeps expanding. It's actually a three day weekend, the first weekend in June, but a lot of cities such as Tualatin are choosing the entire month of June um, to recognize gun violence awareness. And we really would love to have you include orange in your wardrobe, even if it's just a little ribbon um, that you wear. 
And if you'd like to become involved in the Tualatin chapter of Moms Demand Action, please text READY to 64433. Thank you. Proclamation declaring June 2023 to be Gun Violence Awareness Month in the city of Tualatin. <clears throat> Whereas every day more than 120 Americans are killed by gun violence alongside more than 200 who are shot and wounded, and on average there are more than 17,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas Oregon has an average of 522 gun deaths every year with a rate of 11.9 deaths per 100,000 people, the 33rd highest rate of gun deaths in the U.S. And whereas cities across the nation are working to end senseless violence with evidence-based solutions, and whereas support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. And whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever as we've seen an increase in firearm homicides and non-fatal shootings across the country, increased calls to domestic violence hotlines and an increase in city gun violence Whereas in January 2013, Adia Pendleton was tragically shot and killed at age 15. And in June, to recognize Adia Pendleton's birthday, born June 2nd, 1997, people across the United States recognized gun violence awareness and wear orange in tribute to Adia Pendleton and other victims of gun violence and the loved ones of those victims. And whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Dia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange, they chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods, and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas by wearing orange in June, Twelton will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors, and whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe, now therefore be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Tualatin, Oregon, that June 2023 is Gun Violence Awareness Month in the City of Tualatin. The community is encouraged to support efforts to prevent the tragic events of gun violence and to honor the value of human lives. Introduced and adopted this eighth day of May, 2023, city of Twelton, Oregon. Thank you Thank everyone you. for coming and for all of your work in the community. You're around, um, not just in June, but day in and day out throughout and step up to make sure that um, people know that kids are cared about, that survivors are cared about, and um, and even some of the nurses give shots during COVID. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming, Terry. Thank you. That brings us to public comment. Uh, public comments uh, is an opportunity for anyone to address the city council on something that's not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. I'll take folks who are here in the meeting first, and then if there's anyone in the Zoom session that would like to be heard also, we'll do that then. I've got a few sign-ups, which I'll start off with, and that's uh, Jesse Thompson to come on up and tell us about the Memorial Day service that's coming up. Coming. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and members of the sure. council. They can hear in your mic. Okay, there we go. Everywhere in the world. Okay, everywhere in the world, Mayor and members of the council, good evening. Thank you for this time and allowing me to speak. My name is Jesse Thompson. I've been working with Dale Potts on planning and putting together the Memorial Day observance for 2023. I would like to take this time to invite yourselves and all the citizens of the city of Tualatin to attend 
the Memorial Day observance. The observance will take place on Memorial Day, which this year is Monday, May 29th. Some big changes this year. The biggest change is the event will be taking place at the Tualatin Lake of the Commons. In past years, this is the event that was held at Winona Cemetery. We wanted to go ahead and move it closer to the future home of the Tualatin Veterans Plaza. Formal part of the event will begin at 1045 with the missing man flyover. Then our lineup will continue on. We'll have singing by the Tualatin High School Crimson Airs, remarks from this year's selected honored veteran. State Senator uh, Rob Wagner will be there, along with remarks from our own mayor. The formal event will be preceded by a float on the lake by members of the Portland Model Powerboat Association. They will be out there with several of their model powerboats out on the water, some of these replicas of Navy ships. I was out there a couple of weeks ago with them. Someone had a eight and a half foot long model of the battleship Bainbridge um, out there on the water. Uh, group loves to get out there with their floats and their ships. They will be out there before the event uh, takes place. Um, the formal event will be followed by, as in past years, the free community picnic, which is hosted and put on by the Tualatin VFW Auxiliary Post 3452, right over in the Tualatin Community Park. That is just a six-minute walk from the Lake of the Commons. Any questions? <laughs> Very good question. We are on the west side of the lake. It will be on the splash pad. Splash pad will be turned off. Yes. So uh, in the past, reminded people to bring chairs, unless you want to stand the whole time. Uh, would chairs be there or would everybody bring your own? Uh, we will have some chairs there. However, folks are, uh, you know, encouraged to bring their own chairs as well. Um, so in the event, we've had 150 folks show up, hoping to have the same, even more turnout this year. Uh, it will, you've got the old, what I call the Hannigan lot, it's close by. You've got street parking near the Grange. Like, you know, you always park over near uh, Dr. Dweck, Dr. Gordon's office. Which color that is? And walk it's over. Yeah. It's the blue lot, but the white lot, over yeah, white lot. Yeah. it's probably the future's closed as well. Yeah. Should be plenty of parking. I know you have to park in the grass the cemetery. We always have yeah. it. Weird, but sorry, <laughs> but plenty on street parking. Walk. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jesse. All right, thank you. All right, then I have like two gentlemen who uh, want to talk about pickleball. Do you want to come up together or separate? Or you, you can come up together and provide your time. All right. Go ahead. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. My name is Kent Drangsholt, and this is Eric Two Rivers, and we are representing uh, my company at the garages, music venue, tap house, and eatery. If you, I recognize a couple people that have been there, so thank you for attending. Um, Lake Oswego did in pickleball, if you will. And uh, I was asked to testify in front of the Lake Oswego City Council, which I did uh, by individuals in Lake Oswego that want a place to do pickleball. My business is uniquely set up to put in two pickleball courts and two what they call dink courts, practice courts. But they're outside in the back. On the other side of the uh, bushes is a freight train that goes by. And um, so I don't think, I don't think noise is an issue. There isn't a neighborhood within a half a mile of the area. I have been uh, contacted by the president of the association with 700 members that have 
said they would donate $100,000 to put in these courts. The public wants this. My job as a business owner is to satisfy the needs, wants, and desires of the community and to apply to all the laws, of course. So we're here in front of the city council because we think it's a positive move for Tualatin to do this and allow private business. I know the city has pickleball courts. I know the Bay Club has pickleball courts. People can't always afford the Bay Club, but they can come into my place and for $6 play pickleball to their heart's desire. It's something that we feel strongly would help the business, first of all, because we're mostly a nighttime business and I'd like to fill my daytime. They start around eight o'clock in the morning and, and exercise is part of the program um, for elderly people that can't really do tennis or move around as much because pickleball courts are smaller and less of a uh, uh, chance of getting hurt, if you will, by running and such. Eric is here because he would like to represent some of the people that would be interested. Eric is uh, somebody I, I've known a long time, mm -hmm. and he's also been introduced to pickleball through a lot of conversations. Eric? I'm a pickleball player and, uh, and fan. Uh, it's easy to play. It's, uh, it's uh, easy to learn. It's pretty much harmless. It doesn't cause injury or anything. Good exercise. Takes a small space. We could put... We could put four courts in here, actually. It's a small thing. Um, I'm Eric Two Rivers. I'm a member of the Blackfoot Nation. I'm a, a, a retired, semi-retired National Act musician uh, and currently kind of the volunteer music coordinator at the garages. And I'm there three nights a week bringing music that invites other people to come and play music. I'm not there showing off my ability. I'm inviting others to share. The same thing with pickleball. We're inviting others to come and share, participate, and get along together. I'm here to learn from you folks who have uh, directly or indirectly created the city charter and the rules and stuff we go by. There's one word missing from the one sentence that describes uh, what is approved for a public uh, gathering place. And uh, forgive me, I don't have it memorized, but among them is a a nightclub or a, a fitness center or a fraternal club or, you know, the sentence I'm talking about, I think. What's missing is one word, pickleball. He's if right. If you could see your way to include that one word after a comma in that sentence, we'd be off and running. And it'll help the area immediately around the garages because we're talking bringing people to the area that are going to shop in other shops and do other meals, sorry to say, even though we do have food and beverage at the garages, it's not the only thing people want, you know. There's also the Carl's Jr. and the Burger King and the Subway and the, all, the, all the other things that are around there. Um, we'll bring people to all of that. We just need that one word. So can you explain to me, please, what do I need to do to help make that happen? I assume you've already talked to city staff. Have you talked to the city manager or anyone or city staff or planning? Um, Kent has had some communication with them. That's how we learned that one word is missing. Suzanne, um, who I know you all know, um, was the first one I contacted when I became a business owner here. And she helped me work through our occupancy. And by the way, great employee, super lady, very helpful. But don't, don't butter him up. I'm not buttering him up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. They're already great people. Um, and, but from the from a building standpoint, she said, you know what? We don't have anything that would deny that. But from the planning department, I received a communication and it said we wouldn't recommend it. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want a business to provide a service to the public that they want and there's money to do it? So we're kind of up against a what do we do next? I want, I was the first one in Beaverton to do a food pod. And Thank you. And <laughs> I, I understand the process that we have to apply and that there has to be some certain conditions, but we wanted to come to the city council so that you're aware of the effort and the need 
and the desire of the public to have this happen. You have some courts here, it's not enough. Let's put in two more and help a local business compete for the business. How do we do that? Please. Well, first thing he did is just raise awareness. Hopefully with, with his follow up with our city manager. Okay. And that discussion. Cool. We'll get back to you. It's okay if I come back in two weeks? Right, we'll have in two weeks. We've got a really big city health meeting coming in two weeks. Oh, of that's right. The is. budget. Okay. Yeah. That's that's why I asked. That's a little more important. I that's, get that. That's I why I asked. That. You know. Just circle back with staff. Go back. Okay. Wonderful. Can I send a presentation to email to each of you about there's a council well, at Walton.gov. It's all of us. Thank you. I would I would love to give you a presentation so you I can you can visually see what we're talking about and see how we would like to proceed to help the public do this. Council Reyes. Yeah, do you know where the space age gas station is across the freeway there? Next to the uh, Walgreens. It's actually a Lake Oswego address because it's zip code wise. So it's in that. In the back of the building, right in right next to the railroad tracks, there is installed there two level uh, courts already. Yeah. One is used for shuffleboard mm -hmm. and one is used for bocce ball. They were in there when... I took over the building. I don't know if they were approved by the city or not, but they're there. And I apologize if they weren't, but that's what uh, those surfaces are already pre-made. They're ready to go. It would take very little effort to do it. And if we need to enclose them to comply with the law, then there might be some money to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. For taking we appreciate time. your time. That brings us to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items that are considered routine, they will be adopted by one motion unless one on council. We'd like to get item removed or heard separately later tonight. That consists of six items. Item number one, consideration of approval of the special work session of April 12th, 2023, and the work session and regular meeting minutes of April 24th, 2023. Item number two, consideration of resolution number 5685-23. Adopting the City of Tualatin 2024-2028 Capital Improvement Plan. Item number three, consideration of resolution number 5689-23, authorizing the city manager to execute a deed acquiring property for Riverfront Park land. Item number four, consideration of resolution number 5690-23, awarding a contract for professional auditing services. Item number five, consideration of resolution number 5693-23, Increasing the construction contract authorization amount for the Boones Ferry Corridor Sidewalk and Bike Lane Improvements Phase 1 project, part of the Tualatin Moving Forward Program. And finally, item number six, consideration of resolution number 5694-23, bringing the Parks Project Fund and appropriating general obligation bond proceeds in the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Would anyone like any of these, any of these six items removed and heard later tonight. I move that we adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. Any discussions on those motions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say nay. Any abstentions? It's unanimous. All right. That brings us to special reports. I see TBFNR is here in, in strength. <laughs> so come on up. We have the TBFNR at Walton Valley Fire and Rescue District 2023 Data District. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Us. Um, <laughs> we always stand. It's just the nature of how it works. Even in like our own promotional ceremonies and things, the crew stand in the back. Yeah. So I want to, I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Stefan and Jacob. They're in our public and government affairs department. We have Battalion Chief Hennebury here as well. And then also with Lieutenant Childers, if you would please introduce your crew as well. Oh, sure. We have uh, my apparatus operator, Alex Acker, in here. And then the fire EMP, Dr. Perkins. And then the fire department. Thank you. 
So I have a quick presentation to you. I have about 10 slides that I'd like to run through. Um, by all means, if you have any questions during the presentation, and there'll be time after if you have any questions. So again, my name is Laura Hitt. I am our Deputy Chief of Administration. So I directly oversee our logistics division, our organizational health division, and then we also have a business strategy department. Let me get my clicker started here. How are we doing? There we go. <clears throat> so our mission is to create safer communities through prevention, preparedness, and effective emergency response. So we have had a group of staff working together this past year to update our strategic plan. We're moving to a five-year strategic plan, so it will run through 2028, and we are focusing on three goals within that plan, so performance, health, and opportunities. And essentially, our strategic plan drives all things through the district. And so one of the other things we've been trying to work on is making it simpler to understand and read and not so dense um, so that not only our residents and our partners can understand it, but also importantly, our employees. And we have an expectation that our officers, our managers, our leadership team are using that strategic plan when they are developing initiatives and tactics for their departments. The strategic planning process drives our budgeting process, our daily activities, and up through our deployment. Okay. Uh, so related to our strategic plan, when we're talking about performance and health, we've had many retirements over the past three years, which I'm sure is happening in many agencies. And succession planning and carrying on the values of the district is very important to us. And so in this past year, we have promoted numerous lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, district chief of operations, an assistant chief in our fire chief's office, as well as many administrative staff positions as well. And like the cities and fire departments around the nation, it has been difficult to recruit um, in this new environment that we see ourselves in. And so we are really trying to expand our recruitment efforts and we're really pushing with social media as an avenue for recruitment, mass media advertisements, outreach events. So as we're coming out of COVID, we all get to see each other in person again. That was so lost over the past two, two and a half years. So engaging in those events to do what we can to attract more diverse applicants. Our next Firefighter Academy will be this August, 2023. And so we will be conducting two firefighter um, academies each year for the foreseeable few years. And so those are four month academies and they begin every February and every August. And so we have a video on the next slide, depending how all of our AV works. But this next slide is going to be an example of the content that we're really looking at to push to social media. This was inspired and informed by our newest generation of firefighters. Oh, hey, you're already here. We don't have a lot of time. We've got a fire in our district, so come with me. Here's what you need to know. Starting December 2nd, 12th and Valley is hiring firefighter EMTs and firefighter paramedics. We're a big district, so there's a lot of opportunities. We're looking for compassionate, and driven individuals to better serve our community. If that's you, start getting your paperwork together. That includes your fire team scores, CPAT, and any licenses. For more information, check out our website. And we're putting on new videos. But right now, I gotta go. One take. Amazing. <laughs> I could do it if I tried. But you can see trying to engage um, a new, different generation, shorter videos, not something long and heavy, trying to provide the references because there is a lot that goes into hiring a firefighter. So trying to get people attention to get to the right place so that we can start recruiting our new firefighters. <clears throat> so I have a bond update for you. So in 2021, voters approved a bond for TVFNR. Um, it did not increase the tax rate for our residents. And as you can see here on the slide, these are the focus areas that we will have for this bond, which is roughly over the course of 10 years. Um, so we'll be relocating an existing fire station in the Aloha area. That is station 62. And um, we're also looking to fund fire station improvements. So you'll see there on the map if a station identifier is blue. That is one of the targeted stations that we are looking at. 
for a relatively large remodel or depending on the station, a rebuild, um, depending on the size and the bones of that particular station, we're really in our objectives for our fire station remodels, um, looking at safety and security to make sure that our crews are safe within their stations, access control cameras. When we do have um, public engagement, that there's a safe place for the public to engage that doesn't include them going into the fire station. We're looking at seismic improvements to make sure that the the firefighters make it through because the earthquake is coming, right? That the firefighters, maybe the station will be damaged, but our firefighters will be safe so that they can respond to our communities. Um, DEI are initiatives that we're looking at. We're looking to remodel our stations to be more of an inclusive environment for our firefighters. So right now we have stations that have shared bunk rooms with just maybe a pony wall that doesn't necessarily have a lot of privacy and space. We currently have your standard men's and women's locker rooms. And what we would like to do and what we've been learning throughout the nation as new fire station um, builds are occurring is that you provide, um, we will look at providing private shower suites and bathroom suites, but then a more communal locker room style. So you have your locker room and you can change, you can have conversations regardless of gender within this same shared space, but you still have your private areas if you need to get away. Private bunk rooms is what we were going to be exploring in our new station rebuilds. And then lastly, our fourth objective for our rebuilds is the scalability. So we want to make sure as our cities and our areas expand in growth, that the station has enough space if we need to include an additional apparatus, if we need to bring more firefighters into that station, the station needs to be able to house all of those individuals. We are looking at upgrading our training center um, down just south of here. And so a couple of the things that we have on the horizon that we're focusing on is a, what we're calling a recruit academy village. And so, as I just mentioned, eight months out of the year down at the training center, we are training recruits with instructors. And they are currently doing that work in our training center administration building, where we also house in a lot of other training activities and then our day staff. So we would like to relocate the recruits and instructors to a different area of um, the training center so that they can focus on their training, their classroom activities, showers, because they're working hard as well all day. And then the second part of the training center is then also remodeling that training administrative building because we have a lot of activity. You'll see on a slide coming up of the training activities that we perform and the building just needs some updates. So those are going to be two of the initiatives with the training center. We are also going to replace our response, some response apparatus that we have already outlined in our capital replacement plan. So your things like engines, trucks, medic units. And then just making sure that we have funds available to purchase land for future stations as we're constantly analyzing our deployment and the forecasting of the po uh, populations and the incidents that we are um, that we are seeing in our district. So this is the annual incident report for the city of Tualatin. So you can see there the city border on your right is the incident density map to show the general distribution of incidents geographically. There were 3,930 incidents that occurred in the calendar year of 2022. Down there on the bottom right, you see how we like to show the distribution of incidents. So I'll turn your attention to the very bottom. We always like to look at our incident distribution from an hour of day. When are we likely to see incidents occur within our district? Um, as you can see, they tend to peak up as the community wakes up and goes about their day. And then they stay relatively steady throughout the daytime and late into the nighttime hours when the community start to um, go back home, we have, it's not, you know, opposite of what you might see in a Las Vegas, where the nightlife <laughs> is much more adventurous. And so we look at that when we're looking at deployment, the uh, pie chart in the middle is the distribution of incidents occurring in Tualatin by day of week. And all of these distribution, um, this distribution that you see is what we also see district wide. So there's not an anomaly occurring in any of our particular cities, but across the day of the week, it's relatively steady. Our crews stay um, very busy. Monday through Sunday, and then you can see the annual incident account occurring in Tualatin. In that bar chart in the bottom, there was an increase of 587 incidents in the city of Tualatin between 21, um, 2021 and 2022. And then just up there at the top, we like to look at the type of calls that our crews are responding to in the categories such as EMS, fire, our public service calls. And by and large, what we experience in our overall district is the majority of our um, calls tend to be medical in nature, emergency medical services or public services. Technology. We're taking initiatives, those opportunities, opportunities that I was speaking to you about in our strategic plan. Um, we have new leaders in our organization and the idea is to leverage technology 
and we have some long-term projects that we have been implementing. We're always looking for opportunities to capture and leverage our incident data that we respond to on a daily basis. Up there in the top right, that's called a Lucas device. So we were able to purchase Lucas devices for all of our transport units. And what that does is it delivers mechanical chest compressions to a patient um, in cardiac arrest to help improve our cardiac arrest outcomes. And we actually did recently celebrate one of our first survivors with using the Lucas device. So that was very exciting. Um, over on the left here, we're looking at working to train our battalion chiefs in using simulation and voice prompted simulations to help them train so that when we do have the fire, the mass amount of information that's coming at them, that they're ready and they're building the files during training. So with the, when the large incident occurs, they can manage the incident more efficiently. We've been working with Apple. Like I mentioned, health is really important to us. We've been working with Apple. We have a small pilot project right now where some of our responders are wearing Apple watches so that they can understand and monitor um, their uh, physical and emotional distress throughout the day. It has some back and forth where it will prompt them for quite through, uh, with questions at the end, like hey, your heart rate spiked at two o'clock. What were you doing? And maybe bring some more awareness to their own physical and emotional health. And then Lastly, we're also working um, on the development of an iPad app. So we have an app that we utilize in the field to collect our incident information and essentially document our charts, but we really want that app to be something that our crews interact with. So instead of taking the piece of paper out into the field and documenting or having a patient interaction, we have an iPad that is collecting information, but helping push information back to the responders. We have built that, but we would like to expand on it. We have our um, deputy fire marshals and fire inspectors that do commercial inspections. Same thing, instead of a piece of paper, and then going back to your office, to your desktop, and then re-entering all of the information that the iPad app would be used for them. And they would be able to do all that information in the field and then have the information on the iPad re readily available to them for that particular property. And the idea there, it's, um, it's data, right? Everything collects data, the internet of things. Everybody talks about it but it doesn't do you any good if it's just sitting in these individual different houses. How do you collectively pull this information together? And we're working with that company, Emergent. So all of this data and information that is collected on the heart monitor, when we attach it to our patients, that we can ingest that into our system. It can help make our report writing more efficient, but also inform our crews when they're on the scene. And then looking at things in the future, which should be the near future, for example, would be a fire. So you can, you can imagine when our crews respond to a fire, they're putting out a fire, they're not writing a report. So we know that we can get there quickly, but how do we measure the outcome of our performance on the fire ground? And so vehicle telemetry, to be able to take the information from the apparatus where we know when we get there, we're able to monitor the pump pressure, the gallons of water that we're applying when we were able to apply water. So all of these things are things that we are working on. And the idea again, so that we can evaluate our performance and be as efficient um, as we can and effective. I spoke to you earlier about training. This is just a snapshot of the hours of training occurring um, throughout the district in, an, um, in 2022. It's a combination of activities. We have our training center. The stations also do in-station drills. We also have multi-company drills, like you'll see in that top picture above, where we were um, doing an off-site drill for a wildland training, where we will bring a handful of crews together during the day to drill together, and then they go back to their stations in the afternoon. The idea is, again, to build those files, um, particularly when you're talking about things like critical skills, the incidents that don't happen enough so you don't get that training in the field, but they're critical um, types of incidents. And so as much as we can, we can train on that. So when the incident does occur, our crews will be proficient, uh, proficient in their performance. So TDFNR, we have been impacted by the Washington County EMS failures. I'm sure there's been conversations with some of your staff about those challenges. So in Washington County, we have experienced frequent what we call level zero situations. And what that means is there is no transport unit from the private provider contracted to provide, provide transport services in the system. So level zero means no transport units. And so what that does is it requires the fire department to supplement the system. And then we utilize our transport units to get the patient um, securely packaged and then to the um, hospital. So there was an EMS council of both public and private stakeholders that was organized a few years ago to address these system-wide problems. And so one of the recent results of that is just this past few months, 
the county opened up a bid process for transport services in Washington County for improved data sharing, dispatching, and response performance. And so three vendors applied in that process and AMR has been selected as the tra transport provider for Washington County. And right now, Washington County and AMR are negotiating that contract and they have an expected start date of August of this year. Preventing emergencies and reducing risk, educating our residents, it is a very important part of our mission. As I mentioned um, at the first part of my presentation, our deputy fire marshals and inspectors have performed over 3,000 inspections of our commercial buildings in 2022. We've been conducting multifamily housing landlord training sessions. We like to do that twice a year. Again, we can do that back in person now, which is great. Um, but we also, we have some on-demand modules for that training that are also available on tvfr.com. So if people are unavailable to attend an in-person session, we also provide the ability for that training through our website. We're continually teaching hands-only CPR to thousands of students in our district. Remember, you just have to use your hands. There's no more mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, so don't be scared. Make sure if you're not trained, let us know. We'll make sure that to find somebody to help you get trained in hands-only CPR because it really does save lives. Um, we perform post-fire knock and talks to educate residents when they're most impressionable. So when they've had a fire in their complex, in their community, it's a great time for us to show up and remind them about fire safety, help them with their smoke alarms and their prevention activities. And we also recently in April hosted an annual summit for hundreds. I did ask Stefan, hundreds, hundreds of scouts um, to learn about safety. So that was a great event that we were uh, recently able to hold. So in our community risk reduction area, we do have staff specifically assigned to that. Um, and so the idea of community risk reduction is to mitigate the 911 call before it occurs or to look at hotspots that we hotspots that we have in our district to improve community safety. So just very briefly, one of the more recent examples that we had was at a max um, transit station in the Beaverton area. So that just happens to be the transit station that is at the end of the line when you're doing the east to west um, max line. And during the colder months, some of the houseless population, they do like to ride the max train because it's a place of warmth for them. And what was happening in the very wee hours of the night, they get to the end of the road and they have to get off the train. They're not allowed to remain on the train. And in this transit center, there was only an emergency phone to call 911 available for them. So when they were looking for services, they were cold, they were hungry, they would call this phone and it would trigger a 911 response from our crews, which was really creating a large call volume. So with this community risk reduction department that we have on our staff, our manager partnered with TriMet, City of Beaverton, Washington County, multiple nonprofits um, to educate them, to make them aware of what was occurring. And then what can we do collectively to look at other services to provide to the community other than 911 for these non-emergent incidents that come up? And it was really successful. successful. It resulted in a decrease of incidents occurring at that particular location. These um, reduction efforts are never one and done. They're things that we continually have to maintain and keep our eye on the ball, but we're really happy that we now have um, staff assigned to help us with these efforts. And my last slide, um, we do anticipate that our board of directors will refer a levy to the May 2024 ballot. So we currently have an existing 45 cent local option levy, and that is set to, set to expire June of 2025. And so this has been our rate for the last two levy cycles or 10 years. And so the levy for us funds our firefighters, our paramedics, some of our support personnel, and it also allows us to purchase medical and firefighting equipment. So it's not going to be a surprise to any of you that the costs are increasing over the past years at, at quite a rate. And so the current levy rate that we have will not sustain our existing operational expenses. So we will be looking to do an increase. But right now we are conducting analysis and public attitude surveys to understand um, the voter attitudes about that. And we will make sure to keep our partners, including the city of Tualatin, informed as we move through this process in it, in app in anticipation of a May 2024 ballot. That. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you again. Um, I have a question, but first I just wanted to say that I participated in the community um, 
uh, Academy last year and I stayed at station 34 um, overnight and went on many calls, um, <clears throat> which I was told that I, I was, cur I cursed the station because usually <laughs> when there's, when there's, a I was told there's not a lot of calls <laughs> and, um, and there was a ton of calls, uh, but it was, it was a, um, it was such a great learning opportunity, and I, encourage, I know that another counselor is going to take place in that acad an academy, and I encourage everybody that has the opportunity to do that. I've learned so much, and I have such a great appreciation for, um, for what you all do. I was able to see how the fire department also interacts with our police department um, that day, which was, which was great. Um, Let's get to my question. Um, it's about the um, the transport and the um, agreement with AMR and Washington County. So does that mean that that the other private parties won't be used at all, um, and Washington County will only use AMR? And what does that mean for our residents over in Clackamas County? And how does that? How do those lines? Mm -hmm, correct. Work? So. Each county is responsible for establishing ambulance service areas, ASAs for their counties, and then identifying who is responsible for managing those. In the county, the county remains responsible for identifying, and yes, it's the selection of a private um, partner in this case. And so, yes, it will just be AMR. Um, AMR can um, enter into subcontracts or other agreements if needed, but that was one of the expectations of the um, contract that was put together that any bidder there were set expectations of delivery. So the intent is not to water down because AMR provides the transport services in Clackamas County as well as Multnomah County. And so to water down those services for Washington, Washington County is not, the, is not the expectation. And so they have committed to say that they are able to stand up the required units. Um, and there's another component of that where there could be a little bit of ebb and flow between the counties so that they can support each other probably more along the, line, the lines of the county lines as opposed to drastic movement of those units um, into eastern or western portions of the county. But that is a commitment of the contract to not impact the services that they already have. And they will be, they also have contract standards that they have to um, adhere to in those other counties as well. Yes, I, I'm very excited to get to do the community academy in two weeks. Oh, good. So I'll be there. Great. It's pretty impressive. Right? Very... <laughs> That's great. But I have a question about that. Um, she described two different jobs. I think one was EMT and one's paramedic. And I just wondered if you could describe the difference. I have to recall what she did. She say firefighter and paramedic. Um, I'll just generally explain. So we bring in new employees as firefighters, and then to be a firefighter, you have to have an EMS license. And there are varying levels of licensure. The minimum is an EMT. So at a minimum, we require EMT, but you can also have an advanced EMT license, just a different scope of care, an intermediate, or then there's the paramedic. And so when we're hiring for firefighter academies, we're usually looking for a blend. Right now, we're looking heavily for firefighter paramedics. Um, at the at the paramedic licensing, because um, we lost some through the pandemic. And then with the schools being closed, the bringing in of new people through the schools, because to be a paramedic is a two-year degree. And so it was tough, tough for them to get their qualifications and then their um, internship time. And so I think that's what she was referring to. But just so you know, we also have just paramedics, just medical personnel. They don't have um, the firefighting skills. So we also have, we, we tend to call them single role paramedics because it can get confusing between the two terminology. But, and those personnel are just to focus on the EMS um, skills and to help us provide our transport. Because in Yamhill County, where we are in Newburgh, um, we are responsible for that ASA in the transport and that ASA. So those medic, paramedic personnel provide a lot of our transport work. My other question, um, well, I guess just um, you talked about hands-only CPR. So if we are members of the public wanted to find out more, where would they go? TDFR.com. There's an area up in there that says, where do I? And you would be able to see CPR training. And then we'll refer you out to um, companies that can provide that. Absolutely. <clears throat> Some of the questions um, were answered through uh, Councilor. Um, yeah, it was basically on, on the paramedic. How long would it, I guess that's what I, I, I was just in my mind thinking, how long would it take for someone to be accepted as a paramedic? Or is it like recruitment that you do during like the 
high school years or maybe at um, you know community college or mm -hmm. it's in Absolutely. And that is very important for us for our outreach events to really get into the high schools and the events so people understand um, what it takes to be a firefighter, to make sure that they understand the licensing that might be required to have an EMT license it takes a little less time. But like I mentioned, for a paramedic, they might not know that that's a two year degree. And so we really work in our recruitment efforts. Um, we've really been trying to redesign tvfr.com and the recruitment area that we have on tvfr.com to make it as clean as possible for people to understand the different steps that they need to take. But we're trying to really reach early. We have um, what's called a, a Portland Metro Fire Camp for Girls. It's a camp that we have been working on. Um, the city of Portland first started it where it brings in young girls um, Age range, I believe, is around 16 to 21 or 22 to bring them in. And so at that younger age, so they could see that firefighting is actually a career opportunity for them. And during that, we explain to them the different licensing or the things that you need to do to become a firefighter. So just as much as we can sat saturate and educate from our various platforms is, is what we try to do. I think in seeing their options out there, there's not just one way or different way. And I'm glad that we can outreach with it. Yeah, absolutely. We even have a career day, and that's actually targeted for professionals and existing careers. And have you ever thought of a career in the fire service? And to help bring on some more diverse um, residents in our community to, again, firefighting world that they perhaps weren't experienced with. I'm from Southern Oregon. I'm from a rural area in Southern Oregon and firefighting was not something that was on my radar because for me personally, I didn't see it like you would see in the city area. And so as we continue and try to increase the, the diversity within our ranks, then when our firefighters are out in the community, whether they're at a training event, an outreach event, even just grocery, grocery shopping, that our residents can see themselves in our firefighters and think, <laughs> firefighting, that could be a thing for me. And then we want them to reach out. And so we have a, some other opportunities that we work on in our organizational health de um, department to stay in touch with those people, to, out, to help mentor them through the process. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, I appreciate it. I've hospital before and they're just the most wonderful people so thank you okay. to everybody I'm <laughs> just thinking. thank you so much Other questions? well Hillier. just a silly one you did um make a point that the Luca is that what it Lucas? is Lucas mm -hmm. uh, celebrated the first survivors so does that mean that if most people don't survive <laughs> <laughs> we do every effort that we can to promote hands-only cp yeah right <laughs> Stefan, we are going to have to talk to you about our next campaign for yeah um survival of cardiac arrest the the rates can be low um the studies show for every minute that passes um, prior to getting any type of intervention, whether that's just chest compressions or AED. In your buildings, please know where your AED is. It makes a difference. And every minute that goes by, it's a 10% less chance of survival. But we have excellent survival rates in TBF in our service area because of the training of the individuals behind me. The EMS division that we have, our medical director, Dr. Daya from OHSU, where it's just hands-only CPR get that AED there. Let's get there. We send a minimum of six people to a cardiac arrest to make sure that we can push the drugs and manage the airway and manage the scene to quickly get that person to the hospital. But sudden cardiac arrest, and that's sudden cardiac arrest is different than perhaps chest pain where you're still conscious. Sudden cardiac arrest means you have passed and you need help. And so um, pulse point. We have a pulse point app. If you're not familiar, please check that out at tbfnr.com. If you are comfortable, you can sign up to be notified. If you're in a public area and a 911 call comes in for cardiac arrest, you can get a ping that says, please, if you're willing to go help that person and provide those needed chest compressions to get that chain of survival going. <clears throat> and working with our law enforcement, I would be remiss to not mention our law enforcement party uh, partners who have AEDs in their rigs because they're out and about oftentimes arrive prior to our um, to our crews and they have those AEDs and they do chest compressions. 
and and they make a difference. It's amazing. Thank you. For Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. That brings us to our second special report tonight: our climate action plan, engagement plan. Uh, Maddie and Nick, welcome. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. Okay, um, my name is Maddie Cheek. I'm a management analyst in our public works department and I've been co-managing the development of the Community Climate Action Plan with Nick. Nick Westendorf, Deputy Public Works Director, assisting Thank Maddie. <laughs> All right, um, our draft climate action plan is just about complete. So we wanted to um, come to you all to talk about what engagement we're planning um, and get any feedback on that. If you've got it before we um, you know, move on that. Um, I do wanna highlight that this is the last big engagement push for us um, before the plan is adopted. So I think it's really critical that we're able to um, reach people and then make sure people are involved um, in the capacity that they can be. Quick overview of what I'll talk about. I've only got seven slides, so six more to go. Um, <laughs> So for plan engagement, we've got three groups that we're focusing on. One is internal city staff. Um, second is business community. And then third is the you know, broader Tualatin community. So with each of those groups, I'll talk a little bit about the rationale for engaging them, um, some different strategies we'll use to engage them, and then also the timeline for that engagement. Um, and then Lastly, we'll just talk about some next steps between now and plan adoption on the horizon. Okay, let me get my cards in order here. Okay, so first uh, we have engagement with our internal staff members and we'll be doing this through department meetings where we'll meet with representatives from each department to talk about actions that are relevant to their work group. Um, this will give us a chance to kind of identify any gaps that are missing, um, potentially, excuse me, <laughs> we have a dry throat today, um, make sure that their comments and concerns are addressed, and then also um, make sure that the language is right so that folks who are implementing the plan um, feel that it's clear and meaningful to them. Um, so for these, we're actually starting these next, or not next week, this week. Um, we'll be meeting with the Parks Department on Thursday and then the Police Department on Friday. And then these will carry through early June and wrap up with the City Manager's Office and uh, the Finance Department. Really looking forward to those. Um, the second group that we'll be focusing our attention on is the business community. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the business community. And so we'll be doing a um, survey for folks, just a very short survey. Um, it'll provide space for businesses to um, share comments and concerns about how the climate action plan might impact their business, uh, provide feedback on climate action incentives. We've heard a lot through community engagement that folks feel that they need financial help to take action, including the business community. And so um, we're hoping to dig a little bit more deep into what those incentives might look like or what folks are kind of envisioning for how that might help them. Um, and then lastly, uh, this will provide a place for folks to opt into the online open house that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, on the next slide. Um, with the survey, we're also hoping to gather information though on what folks are already doing. I know that there's a lot of good um, actions going on already. And so ideally we can kind of collect that information if folks are willing to share and then highlight that um, at later points in the engagement process and through implementation as well. Um, and then lastly, we're hoping to identify um, or just ask about kind of best practices for communication with the business community as that's been kind of a challenging um, piece of this engagement for us. So I'd love to hear from folks um, what their preferences are on it. Okay, um, last, last, last but not the least. Oh, guys, it's late. <laughs> um, we will be uh, doing an, another online open house to engage the broader Tualatin community. Um, 
Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I skipped. Go back. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about some of the strategies we'll be using to engage the business community. So uh, we have a Chamber of Commerce networking event planned on June 9th. Uh, we'll be sharing a little bit of information about the plan, asking folks to do the survey, et cetera. We'll plug it at the lit or at a upcoming Latino business networking meeting as well. Um, share with partners and also share with you all and um, ask that you all share it out with your business contacts as well. Um, and then lastly, we are thinking about doing some door-to-door -door outreach. Um, and so I want to list a couple groups that I've been thinking about and just also keep in mind that we are limited in terms of staff time and capacity, so we do have to prioritize some groups. So any feedback on this piece would be um, more than welcome. Um, so one of the groups we were thinking about was the 10 largest employers in Tualatin um, for that reach component. Another could be um, Latino owned businesses and or small businesses as those may or may not overlap in some cases. Um, and then lastly, we've talked a little bit too about reaching out to businesses that provide um, kind of climate services, if you will. So folks maybe who install solar panels or stuff like that. Um, so those are some of the options we're considering. Um, again, if you've got thoughts on that, please do let me know. Okay, and truly last but not least, um, community-wide engagement. So um, we'll do an online open house to share what's in the plan with residents and um, folks who live, work, and play in Tualatin. Um, it's a place where people can share their comments and concerns and then also indicate their level of support for different actions. Um, in our climate action plan, we'll have an, a little indicator of level of community support. So we hope to use the information gathered here um, alongside some of the other uh, public engagement you know, information that we've gathered already uh, to show that in the plan and help everyone prioritize what actions we take as just one of the little one of the indicators of many that we can look at when figuring that out. Um, we've got several things we're considering to get this out to people. Um, so one, well, we've got a few groups here. One is print materials. So similar to the last online open house, we will um, mail postcards to every address in Tualatin. They'll have a QR code on them and it'll encourage folks to complete the um, online open house. Uh, additionally, we're thinking about placing an ad in the physical version of Tualatin Life so people can see that. Um, and then also printing flyers and A-frame signs to place at popular community destinations like in parks or New Seasons or Starbucks, et cetera, um, so that folks can, you know, see it out and about um, and then scan it and complete it. So in addition to print materials, we're also thinking about digital, of course. So we plan to do a couple email blasts, one to our project listserv, that's folks who have opted in through prior engagement events and through our website. Um, also emailing groups that have expressed interests like the Tualatin High School Climate Action Club and uh, the Pole Center's Earthwise crew, both have been very engaged so far. Um, we'll also keep the website updated, of course, and then um, share in the city's newsletter and on social media as well. And then last but not least, um, we'll do some interpersonal engagement as well. Um, our subconsultant ESO has been building relationships with the Latino community throughout this project, and they'll focus some of their effort on engaging with those folks. Um, and then we will attend community events um, such as the I think it's the Stone Ridge Community Meeting in June, I want to say. I can't remember if it's June or July, but one of those months. Let's get on that. All right, yes. So that's all I had on the engagement component. But in terms of next steps, um, we will be pretty busy May through July engaging folks and trying to collect feedback on the climate action plan. Um, our intention is to come back July 10th to present the draft plan to you all, and then shortly thereafter launch the online open house. Um, the goal is to have you all kind of see and hear about it first, share it out to the broader public, and then once the online open house closes, um, we'll integrate all the feedback that we've heard um, into the final plan and get that all finalized and ready to go. And then um, ideally it will be uh, presented for adoption in September. That is all I have. Um, back to you, Mayor. <laughs> Ready. Hey, Mayor.
Maddie. Thank well, you. This is so exciting. <laughs> I was wondering, um, on the business, I did see um, that you were going to reach out to the business CIO, and I just wondered, because I think if you're reaching out to the bigger businesses, and then you reach out to the chamber and the business CIO, you're going to get a lot of the smaller companies, too, and it's a pretty good swath of our yes. businesses. And then on the, um, when you get to the next step, I was wondering um, if you could maybe somehow reach out to our advisory committees and cert because that's mm -hmm. a lot of things in our community that would probably give us half the feedback so thank, thank you good so. feedback um you mentioned you while well, i was reading that you did um how's that working on so um yeah, with the that's where we're trying to figure out kind of which groups within the ones I mentioned, like that we want to focus on. So let's say, for example, we did select like let's let's really focus on the top ten employers. Um, with those ones, you probably can't just pop in and talk to the person you want to talk to, right? So we would need to do a little bit of staff research ahead of time to try to figure out who's the contact contact, and we schedule a time to come chat with you briefly um, and do that. If it's more of a small business approach, um, we can actually just go door to door and kind of, you know, go in with a flyer and say, hey, I'm from the city and, you know, here's here's what we're hoping to to learn. Okay, so it's business door to door. Approach. Yes. Correct. Okay. Correct. <laughs> yes, not residents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just got two. So we can think of those categories mm -hmm. in addition to the 10 marks, of course, as a bit for their large fleets mm -hmm. of vehicles. Mm -hmm. They might not be one of our biggest ones, but they have an impact. And then those businesses that have, um, how do I put it the right way? Serious HVAC systems. Mm -hmm. and what I've been told, that's the biggest one, the biggest emitters. So they might not be, again, a big employer, but they've got one hellacious HVAC system on their building. Yeah. Maybe add those two things to your category. Okay. Thank you. I know Nick has an announcement now, don't you? Super extra special <laughs> late edition <laughs> special announcement. Yes. Um, I am excited to share that staff are preparing an application for the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Grant, CFI. It's a federal grant application that's opening up. The pot of money is about $700 million over the next two years. And it is aimed at EV um, infrastructure deployment in communities, so charging infrastructure. We are partnering with Fourth Mobility, a nonprofit that works in the electrification of transportation realm. They're from uh, Washington, Washington State, not DC. And uh, Portland General Electric, they're gonna help us prepare our application and provide the matching funds for us. Uh, so light on details as it's just happening, but we are in the process of getting the application together. We're going to try to recruit some neighboring cities to join. Um, we're going to go for $15 million and see if we can, that's about 500 chargers and see if we can share those across some neighboring communities and get some infrastructure in place. What else is relevant. Uh, application is due May 30th. So we are a tight turnaround on that. Yes. Yeah, so um, more to come in the next two weeks, but Wanted to share that with you all. Um, we will be requesting a letter of support if that's something you all are interested in. We don't need a formal vote. We would just need a nod of approval. And then I uh, and staff can work on drafting that and present it to the community council, council if you're interested. Sounds like we're underwater. Yeah. Or a, uh, what is that called when you see a big deal in the sky? Uh, yes. So. If you have any questions,
um, and helping landlords you know, with this to encourage that. You know, the single family home pretty much can handle it, but it's a little bit more difficult in multifamily housing. Uh, so if we could get that and have it in some public parks and public areas. Yeah, multifamily uh, city owned facilities, so parks or the core area lots, uh, things like that. And then uh, workplace charging is also something we've identified. All right. Well, great. I just wanted to thank um, Sherilyn and you all for all the work that you've done on the climate action planning and the mayor. And um, really, when we were um, in DC, we were, had that lens started because of this. And then you know as much as I do that this is a really interesting time in our country's history with the um, Inflation Reduction Act, where this particular administration is really reaching out to cities, towns, and villages in a really, you should have seen the amount of people from each agency that were in D.C. to talk to people. And so it's a, we know it's a finite timeline, but um, for us to be prepared and for you to have the vision and for you guys to be willing to do the extra work. I just wanted to express my gratitude and I really appreciate it. I'm really proud to live in my city. So, I just let us know what you need. If you need phone calls, maybe like that, just let any of us know because I know it's a tight timeline. So I think we can do to move this faster. <laughs> Thank you. you guys, but with, we need supporting. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. So is there a policy component that's required? And I was just wondering if TTSB is somebody that you reached out to. TTS, in consideration, I guess it's not a... They are a partner we've identified, yeah. There, it, the, the application will allow us to plan for the deployment of this. So the policy creation can be included in the application. So we're going to put some rough framework together, but that will, it'll be a three to five year project. And the beginning phases will be community engagement, site selection, and drafting policies around how this gets deployed. Anything else for Thank you for coming tonight and giving us the update. Thank Thanks you. for having us. All right, now we get to talk to Don again. Bring us to general business. Item number one. I know the excitement in it. The excitement. You know? uh, consideration of ordinance number 1474-23, establishing a core area parking district, CAPD, tax rate for fiscal year 2023-2024. Welcome, Mr. Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, in case you forgot who I was since I last talked to you earlier tonight, I'm Don Hudson. I'm the assistant city manager. And tonight you are considering ordinance 1474-23, which would set the quarry or parking district tax rate for 23-24. Uh, part of the responsibilities of the quarry or parking district is to recommend a tax rate and the budget to the city council. At their April 18th meeting, the board met and are recommending a 7% increase to their tax rate. It is an ordinance because the schedule with including that amount is included in our in our municipal code. Uh, at that, uh, Councilor Reyes is a member of the board and she uh, might have a couple things to say about their recommendation. It wasn't taken lightly. I, in fact, we talked about it in April and we requested back then to um, just think about it because we really wanted to make sure that we didn't um, just make a rash decision and and, and just kind of uh, come up with numbers. And I have to say that they were really um, 
diligent. And when we came up with the number, it, it seemed like everybody was on board and felt that it was um, very achievable. So I'm just thankful for all those business owners that are in that area serving the community voluntarily. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to recommend it. And yeah, thank you. Well. There was a lot of good dialogue at that meeting about the appropriate amount and the understanding that there are needs, uh, operational and the capital needs in the budget committee meeting. I talked about the ADA improvements and making sure they had the capital uh, in the future when they need those. So there was a lot of good dialogue and, and they were really all uh, unanimously backing uh, the need for this tax rate going forward. I motion for the first reading by title only of ordinance number 1474-23. Second. I have a motion and a second for first reading by title only of ordinance number 1474-23. Discussions on those motions? That motion. Uh, so it's a roll call vote. So Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor Gonzalez, I'm getting it dry. Councilor Brooks, aye. Council President Pratt, aye. We vote aye. Also, ordinance number one four seven four dash two three, an ordinance adopting the core area parking district tax rate and credit for fiscal year twenty twenty three twenty twenty four. I motion for a second reading by title only of ordinance number fourteen seventy four dash twenty three. Second. I have a motion and a second for second reading by title only of ordinance number 1474-23. Any discussions on those motions? Seeing none, Councilor Gonzalez. I'll go. <laughs> so I? <laughs> yes. You know, Nicole was going to put all good in it. <laughs> Councilor Brooks. Aye. President Pratt. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. So Hillier. Aye. So Reyes. I vote aye also, unanimous. Thank you. Ordinance number 1474-23, an ordinance adopting the core area parking district tax rate and credit for fiscal year 2023-2024. Motion to adopt um, ordinance 1474-23. Second. Second. I have a motion in two seconds for uh, adoption of ordinance number 1474-23 and discussions on that, on those motions. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. President Pratt. Aye. Aye also, it's unanimously the ordinance is adopted. Uh, we had no items removed for consent. Uh, that brings us to council communications. Since we had a very abbreviated uh, work session, we'll go ahead and do our council roundtable now. I'll start with Councillor Sacco. Um, I attended the Washington County proposed budget meeting on May 3rd, um, but I know a couple others were there that are more well-versed in these things, so I will let them speak. Um, and I also wanted to remind everybody that there will be a pride celebration on June 3rd at 10 a.m. on the commons and to help spread the word, please. Well, here. Um, I have not had any official meetings uh, since last we met. However, I will reiterate the uh, uh, invitation to the uh, showing of the first day film at Community Talks event at Walton High School, Thursday night, uh, food truck, Oscars Taqueria, 6 to 6.45, resource fair event from 6.45 to 815 and Carrie Bates uh, from uh, Hazelden and Betty Ford will be the community conversation. That's a risk. Um, no official meeting, but yesterday, I sorry, last um, Thursday, I attended the Latino Business Network um, here in this building, and um, there were a lot of uh, businesses um, that either do business here in the community 
or um, um, live here in a community that uh, we're here. And I'm always very happy with the city on how they put these events together. We talked about the recycled and trash and um, how to deal with that. <laughs> so it was an interesting conversation. Um, yeah, so just that was what I did. And it's mostly um, a fun, uh, for me, it's a really good way to connect with the Latino community. It's also fun. Question to go. Also, Brooks. Um, I actually didn't attend meetings this week either, but I did want to um, say that the good evening to Walton, I just wanted to say thanks to my fellow counselors and the mayor for, and our city staff and city manager for a successful, um, I think it was a successful fun event and a great idea. So great job, everybody. And um, also just wanted to acknowledge, I think it's Asian American um, Pacific Islander or Heritage Awareness Month. So of May, um, although I know we're kind of getting through May, but I just want to acknowledge those. Thank you. It say Grimes. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I also went to, I actually went in person to it because I thought you were going to be there to the Washington County proposed budget meeting, but it was fun because I got to talk with counselors from Tigard mostly and um, catch up with them. Um, it was very interesting and it made me very proud of Don and the job he does. Um, they have a they have a real problem at Washington County because most of their money comes from property tax revenue. So that's growing at just under 6%, but um, their expenditures are growing at close to 8%. So there's a big discrepancy. But the, the things I really noted is that we have is they didn't have a capital improvement plan. Um, they didn't have a strategic plan. Um, they're having to deal with, and they've been using one-time funds for their operations, which a long time. So it's good that they have a new person in there. Um, they're also going to do a lot of cuts by um, cuts to s staff, you know, and that's really tough. So, and then um, I know the mayor will probably mention this because he was there, but I hope he will um, talk about the question he asked about MSTIP and um the other meeting I went to was C4, and we actually didn't talk much about tolling because that's just when we got the news, so we thought we'd wait a moment. Um, it did get brought up about who's on that committee at the state, but nobody wanted to delve into it yet. But we got to meet Laura Edmonds, who's um, Clackamas County's new economic development manager, and all the cities talked about like what we want. And it was really interesting because, like I said, you know, we want these living wage jobs and we don't really want a distribution center and then Canby and Happy Valley are like, we want a distribution center. So it was kind of fascinating what the different cities wanted. But the one thing um, I think that was across the board was everybody has infrastructure needs. So. Um, on the 27th, the Metro Mayor's Consortium met uh, went through a legislative update and spent a majority of the time talking about tolling. Then two days, three days later, that, you know, the whole tune changed. So we'll see again, it came up today at a, a Washington County coordinating committee prep meeting of everyone trying to figure out what this governor's task force is going to be and who's going to be on it. And if it's all legislators from outside the area, that doesn't make sense. So more to come there. Later that afternoon, uh, Greater Portland Inc., the Small Cities Consortium. It was my second viewing, I mentioned before, of the Metro presenting the UGB uh, planning framework on what they envision how uh, they're going to roll out a possible UGB expansion and the consideration they're going to look at and what's available. Um, lots and lots of questions because, of course, with Greater Portland Inc., it was very focused on business development and business uh, build out uh, versus residential. Uh, so more to come there. I also want to thank uh, Megan and Sherilyn and the whole city staff for the state of the city. But it went real well. Enjoyed it very much. Um, on the 28th, we had the Community That Cares kickoff for Councilor Hillier uh, leading the charge with Twalton together and LEAP 
Uh, very excited to see where this goes and hopefully you got a lot of folks that signed up as partners and good, great. More to come, terrific. On the third, we had our five cities lunch. Uh, we were, a uh, big part of the discussion was uh, Metro, I don't know if you saw the email, Metro has their planning event. They held one, they're having one coming up in the 20 something, on the 20th, uh, about helping develop Metro's uh, priorities for the next few years. Five people showed up for all of Metro from all the whole region for their first meeting. One of them was Sherwood. <laughs> so I'm gonna to try to get to the next one. And it was the typical dot exercise of what should be important and what should be, Metro should be looking at in terms of future projects, future vision. Um, I think they were a little bit disappointed in the attendance. Uh, what was noted that there wasn't one Metro counselor there that could have affected it. Yes. So uh, I'm going to try to make it it's the 20th something. It might get buried in your email. I mean, uh, from Metro, it came from uh, President Peterson herself. So if you, if you can find it in your email, you might want to look at it. Uh, I don't think you have to go to Metro headquarters. You can do it via Zoom. Um, the Washington County budget meeting. <laughs> uh, that was interesting because my phone started exploding when um, Chair Harrington talked about withholding the whole MISTIP fund for this year, and that had not been discussed with her fellow commissioners. Or staff. Or staff. So um, first you can see the mayors went bananas. My phone is like, <laughs> it was a good thing I wasn't there uh, about that. And, you know, they're looking at a 7% cut MISTIP anyway, mm -hmm. and that's on existing projects. The current MISTIP cycle is frozen in time. So all that, all those projects reviewed, uh, we looked at like uh, Boone's Ferry Road study, improvement of the intersection of Boone's Ferry Road and 12th and Sherwood, the traffic circle at Saipol and Herman are all on ice. They've got to get through all the projects that are on the books right now, and they're looking for 7% cuts, or actually taking things out of the project plan that they already allocated funds for. So it's going to be pretty brutal as, in terms of transportation funding. Uh, as I, I remember, it's only the cities can expect a 1% increase, and that's about it for library funding. For library There's funding, no cut, at least a 1% is still lower. We were Doesn't, scheduled yeah. to get two, yeah. so no, it's one. And some cities yeah. are... Um, Good. That's good. That's a big hit for them because they're going to keep up with inflation. Mm -hmm. so they're going to have to cut back on their library hours because uh, they're going to primarily rely on county money. So, you know, as the chair said, this budget isn't settled yet. There's still, still more to come, but we need to be keeping our eye on the ball, especially in my mind, between MSTIP and the sheriff and yeah. what's going to happen with public safety. Um, I talked to the chair offline. You know, given her experience in the jail and getting stuck in the elevator, that the jail has got to be fixed. The county is going to have to bond something, do something to get the jail fixed uh, or expanded because they just don't have the money. They, they can't do it. And that's a critical facility for all of us. Because, um, I'm hearing for more and more business uh, folks um, that some, you know, if someone gets arrested, they're just getting ticketed and released again because mm -hmm. the jail doesn't have capacity or they're not a high, a high enough level of uh, violence, if you will, that they get in. Um, and today was the, the Washington County Coordinating Committee workshop on the 2023 Regional RTP. So I sent you that 45 pager, I think, 60 pager. Remember, we had a meeting a few weeks ago where we put our projects in the pot. I think Mike McCarthy gave the presentation with Cody, uh, what our projects are for the region. Uh, they've come up, it's, a, you know, it's billions of dollars over the next 20 years of projects. They're trying to you know, get on the uh, fiscally constrained, which means we do have the money for it over time. And then there's the strategic ones. And there seems to be a little disagreement and uh, about how the categories were picked and you know what was considered strategic versus being uh, fiscally constrained. Uh, so JPAC's having a meeting on that. Uh, Mayor Calway, who's our representative on JPAC was in the meeting today, um, as was uh, Mike McCarthy. And he heard all our viewpoints and we'll be taking the JPAC about this regional transportation plan because this is required by the federal government 
that you have to give it up to the feds and this is how you get your funding from the feds over the next 30 years. Um, but uh, it, it just seemed Metro, this is my opinion, pushed this very quickly because they had a deadline to hit for the feds. They really didn't get out to do all the outreach they should have gotten and because they just didn't have the time to get it done. And something like this, it's now going to come to JPAC. You might have, you're going to have Clackamas County's views, you're going to have Washington County's views. Of course, you have the city of Portland. So I'm glad I'm not on JPAC. <laughs> uh, and then this afternoon, before this meeting, I went to the Aging Task Force. Uh, terrific presentations given by Cody on our uh, city transportation efforts and the upcoming TSP. TriMet gave an overview of their, uh, not, their version of what I call moving forward the new bus lines that are proposing. Uh, and then uh, Deami Valentine from Washington County who was there, gave uh, the folks an update on the Washington County Transit Study, which we were a sponsor of with uh, additional cities. That was very well received. Um, so lots of questions about services and route changes for TriMet from the aging population, especially when it comes to getting the OHSU, the VA clinic, all the critical facilities they need to get to that people don't think of, you know, quite often. It's not about just getting down to downtown Portland. It's how do I get to OHSU in a timely, you know, manner, or get to the VA clinic, or get to a medical center. That's it for me. Just sure. um, next council meeting is May twenty second, and uh, we all know that uh, as of right now, it, it's going to be a big one, but on work session, uh, Ross and the team will give a, uh, an update on the parks bond. This will be, and so that will be great. And we have a new employee in the police department that will be introduced that night. So Onyx will be here to be introduced and, uh, that'll be a, a nice, a nice way to start that meeting. So you don't want to miss it. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Do I also have a motion to recess? All right. I have a motion and a second to go ahead and close our meeting for this evening. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you. Good evening. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>